Welcome back to our coverage from AWS reInvent 2018. This is the Amazon Web Services Global User Education Conference, and we're live with you from the SANS Expo, which you can see behind us here in Las Vegas. Uh, my name is Ian Massingham. I'm with AWS Evangelism. I'm the developer evangelism team here at Amazon Web Services. And for this next uh, segment, we're going to be uh, exploring a service that was announced here at AWS reInvent on Sunday night yeah. in an event that we have called Midnight Madness, which is a kind of weird fusion between a tech <laughs> conference and this thing that they have in US sports where the hardcore fans come out on a Sunday night to pre-celebrate the, uh, the new season, right? That's the, yeah, I heard about I it, so. obviously. I'm, I'm from Europe, so, you know, but I heard about it. Uh, and this uh, launch relates to a service that's been around for a long time, a service that's been around since 2006. We've got three members of the team here that are responsible for enhancements to this service with me, and as usual, I'm going to kick off by asking you to quickly introduce yourselves, Absolutely. please. Yeah, my name is Sean Davis. I'm a principal engineer with uh, Amazon S3. Hi, I'm Rob Wilson. I'm a product manager working most recently on S3 batch operations. And I'm Christopher Bartenstein. I'm a principal product manager in S3. Great. So all three of you said S3 there when you described who you are and where you work. So uh, my obvious question now is, what is Amazon S3? Bear in mind that a lot of viewers on the stream here are probably not that familiar with Amazon Web Services. So can you tell them a little bit about what this service is in its pre-enhancement state maybe and how customers use it? Excellent. Thanks, Ian. Uh, so Amazon S3, the simple storage service, is a way for users and companies, enterprises, to store their data in the cloud. So a user at home who's familiar with their own PC, they're storing things like photos, videos, any kind of file they're creating themselves, work products, things you want to retain for the long term. On the enterprise scale, you have companies that the most important thing for them is retaining data for the long term. They've got business critical data. You've got companies like Netflix that has media files that are serving their streaming service. You have companies like Airbnb that has all these photos and rich images of all the listings they have on their site. So that's something they can store in Amazon S3. And when that data is stored in S3, it's stored in multiple different availability zones, multiple data centers. So you have a lot of redundancy built into how you store your data. It's got 11 nines of durability. There's a lot of benefits to storing in the cloud because you can just start off as a small company and as you continue to store data, we'll grow to petabytes or exabytes to handle whatever you need to store as a company. And then we've got the choices of all these different storage classes you can store your data in. So there's a lot of different options in S3. Great, we'll return to storage classes a little bit later because that's one of the launches. But the first thing I want to dig into is this new feature called S3 Batch Operations. Can you describe what that feature is and what kind of problems it helps customers solve? Yeah, so I'll take that question. Um, so S3 Batch Operations is a new, function, a new uh, feature that we're launching in preview. And what it's going to allow you to do is with a single, uh, single request, you're going to be able to ask, uh, ask us to go perform an operation across millions or billions of objects in your in your S3 bucket, um, and so so take uh, a good example of, of what customers might want to do would be to copy an entire bucket, and this is something uh, that if you've got a really small bucket, you might be able to do that really easily yourself. But when your bucket gets up into the millions or billions of, of objects, that becomes a little bit more challenging, uh, in particular because of the size of the job. So uh, what batch operations uh, takes care of for you. Um, is uh, is making sure that we uh, we execute the job to completion, that we we do the the tracking, um, that we uh, what we do is auditable, so you get a final report at the end, um, and we take care of any transient failures or or any reliability issues that you might incur if you try to do this yourself. Um, another case, so we talked about copying an entire bucket. Another thing you might do would be to uh, apply tags or or reset ACLs. Uh, on your objects. Again, that's something that as we find as, as customers have been using S3 for a long time, they may adopt or, 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 or uh, new security practices, new best practices, and they want to say, I want to go apply this to my entire bucket, make sure all my objects are up to, up to my, my, my new bar. Uh, and this is something that customers have found, found difficult, but with batch operations, they're going to be able to uh, very easily uh, apply, say, a tag to the, their objects or apply ACLs across their entire bucket. Uh, again, in one easy request, whether that's from the console, the SDK, or the CLI. I think you might have answered this question to some extent in the description that you just gave there, but what are the benefits of using S3 batch operations over kind of writing my own automation engine? So I could write my own software to control S3 in this way with my own in-house code, could. right? So you why should could. I use batch operations rather than do um, that? It, it should just be easier to use what we've provided. Uh, so there's, there's certainly... Uh, nothing that we're doing that you couldn't do yourself, but what we find is that most customers 
uh, don't want to do it themselves, yep. right? And so it's a lot of work. And, and when you're doing an operation on say 10 or 100 or 1,000 objects, hey, you might write a, a little script with a for loop that goes across your list of objects and does that, and that's fine, and you can run that on your, on your desktop computer. Um, but when you've got a long running job that's running across millions or billions of objects, that's going to take a while. Yep. And there's a lot that can happen during that you time. You've got to manage failure scenarios. You've got to manage, exactly. Yeah. So you, your, the PC, your desktop might, might uh, lose power or crash or disconnect from the internet. And at what, at what, point, what point you need to start over again, right? And so, so now you're incurring the cost potentially of doing all those operations again. Yep. Um, another thing that becomes not trivial is, is knowing where you are in that job. How far, how, what's your progress? Um, and then creating a report of all the, of all the objects that either you succeeded, succeeded or, or failed. Um, and so we provide all that functionality out of the box. Uh, it's really easy to use. Uh, we think you, you don't need to be a, a programmer to be able to use it. You'll be able to go click through the console and, and get your, your storage operations done uh, at scale. Very easily. Okay. Uh, just thinking about use cases for a moment. As a customer, you talked in generic terms about things like tag updates or access control list updates. Are there any other use cases that you have in mind or that you foresee certain customers putting this service to? Yeah, yeah I think another big one is going to be, um, uh, so, so coming back, I, we haven't gotten into the storage class yet, but one of the storage classes we support is Glacier. Yep. So for that really cold data, customers move their data to the, to the Glacier storage class through Lifecycle, for example. Uh, and, when, and when you do that, um, uh, if you want to read that data, you have to restore it back. And so sometimes customers have uh, a lot of data that they want to restore. Uh, they might want to restore an entire bucket or an entire prefix of a bucket. Um, and so they have to go one by one and, and issue restores on each of those objects. And so that's another thing where batch operations can help, uh, help you restore. You just supply the list of objects, whether that's uh, a CSV that you, you construct yourself or you provide us an inventory report from from us, the inventory capability, um, and then we'll go and, and perform that operation, in that case, restore. Okay, yeah. great. Now, you mentioned storage classes there, which we'll come to in a second, but I just want to remind our viewers on the stream, first of all, that we're bringing you coverage from AWS reInvent 2018, and we're also taking questions on twitch.tv slash AWS via chat, so if you do have any questions for our expert guests here on the show, uh, please uh, let us have those via chat. I will see them on my screen, and I'll put them to our, our experts live. So let's move on and talk a little bit about storage classes. Uh, how do I use existing S3 storage classes to improve cost efficiency? Because that's one of the main use cases for this particular set of features, right? So how do I yeah. go about doing that? Yeah, for sure. So in S3, we have different storage classes. And what we did, and the service is around now for you know about 12 years, we innovated in behalf of our customers. And so we created different storage classes in order to get the lowest cost for customers and design for very specific use cases. So for example, we have S3 standard, which is really ideal for active data, so for frequently accessing data. For example, if you have analytics, you really want to access your data, do something with your data, turn around. S3 standard is an ideal storage class. We have SIA, standard infrequent access, which is an ideal storage class for use cases like backup or disaster recovery, where you really don't really access the storage very often. And then you have obviously Amazon Glacier, which is ideal for archive, and a few other storage classes. And so what customers do, they use these storage classes in combination. So they use S3 standard at the beginning, analyze data, and then data gets cooler. They use some of our building blocks, like storage class analysis, to figure out what portion of data can be lifecycled to standard infrequent access. And that's very powerful to really optimize cost in S3. And it works super well for predictable data. Um, so you can do that with Amazon S3, with the different storage classes in the building blocks. OK, and presumably intelligent tiering relates to this idea of moving data between tiers. So yeah. can you talk about precisely what intelligent tiering is? And most importantly, tell us a little bit about how it actually works. So yeah, what's sure. happening under the covers when, when customers make use of that feature? Yeah, for sure. So as I said before, for predictable workloads, when your storage gets cold over time, the existing solution of standard and SIA and lifecycle storage to SIA is really ideal. However, we've also heard from customers, it's very hard for unpredictable workloads, for workloads with changing access patterns. For example, think about if you just don't know the access pattern. And so we launched a new storage class Sunday night, Monday morning, called S3 Intelligent Tiering. And that storage class is really for unpredictable workloads for workloads where the access patterns are changing. It goes from hot to cold, from cold to hot. And what the storage class is doing, Ian, it monitors your storage on a very granular object level 
And then, depending on the access pattern, it moves your storage from a frequent access tier to an infrequent access tier, which is a lower cost. And so that means for customers, they save money automatically. So it's really the first cloud storage class out there which enables cost savings for customers without doing anything. It's like fully automated. And what kind of data would you recommend that customers use the intelligent tiering storage class for? Yeah. So there are a couple of themes around customers told us they really like about this new storage class. So one is when you have a data lake, you have a lot of organizations and departments, think about an enterprise company, and all of them access your storage. So it's really hard to figure out what the access pattern is. One customer told us, for example, they have hundreds of data scientists accessing the storage every day, getting data in, getting data out. So it's actually impossible to figure out the access pattern. So for those workloads where it's changing, it's an ideal storage class. Another storage class uh, use case, which is really good, is when the access pattern is unpredictable. So think about, for instance, there's a, there's a company um, who saves satellite images. And those images are not accessed for a long time. But then if an event happens, they want to get the data really quickly and want to access it. Intelligent tiering is exactly doing that. It moves the data from the infrequent access tier back to the frequent access tier if you need it. OK, that's great. That's the kind of use case where you see uh, satellite photos that get featured in news stories, for example. They're, this part of the world that you might not have yeah. looked at for years all of a sudden becomes right. relevant, and you need that object back so that you can access it, right? That is exactly right, yes. Cool. We've got a couple of questions from the stream which relate to batch operations. I just want to quickly jump back onto that and, and make sure we answer these questions from, from our viewers. The first one is from uh, Billy75, and they're asking whether it is possible to perform batch operations across regions. So how does yeah. that work out? I think I know the answer, but I think you should answer <laughs> it anyway. Um, so, so batch operations is a, is a feature that exists within a region. Um, and so you want to create your job in the region where, you're, where your data lives. Um, yeah. The one exception to that, of course, is copy, where you can do a, a uh, so the copy operation in S3 supports copying across regions. Okay. And so using batch operations, you can copy your data from one bucket in one region to a, to a bucket in a different region. Great, okay, but uh, in the traditional sense, S3 buckets live within one region and one region only. So any That's operation right. within a bucket is going to be restricted to that region unless you choose to copy to a secondary bucket. That's exactly right. Yeah. Then the uh, second question is about, uh, it's from Practice AI. He asks, or oh, they ask, uh, how online is batch operations? I think what they are asking about is the update rate. So if I have a million objects in my bucket and I issue an operation on those million objects, how many thousands, tens of thousands, or hundred thousands of operations per second can I expect to see? Yeah. yeah. I, oh, you want to take that? Go ahead, yeah, Rob. So I can talk about that one. Uh, we expect customers to run many different size objects. So on the one hand, I think the customer is asking a little bit about progress notifications and what they're going to see along the way. Yep. So one of the great features of this versus building it yourself is the fact that you can check in every few minutes and see exactly how many of operations have succeeded, how many have failed, and watch that progress happen over time. So that's a great improvement in visibility that customers don't have today. The other one is really thinking about, well, well when I get to the scale of millions and billions, how long is this going to take? One of the, once again, one of the great benefits of this feature is you're handing that work off to AWS. It's asynchronous. You as a customer can go about your business, continue to build the applications that are key to your business, and offload that to S3. This feature ties in really well with some of the performance improvements we announced earlier this year for Amazon S3. So with thousands of read and write TPS per partition, as your storage grows, so will your performance overall in S3, and so will your performance in batch operations. Okay. So that customer could see thousands, tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands of TPS potentially on batch operations, depending on how large their storage is. So you could see some really great performance. Great, excellent. And there's a question here about pricing from, I love this, Nick. Haggis Tech, just wondering whether this person's from Scotland or not, but Haggis Tech. Uh, how does uh, pricing work for intelligent tiering? What is the uh, yeah. what are the pricing metrics or pricing levers that are relevant yeah. in pricing sure. our service? So, as the intelligent tiering has two access tiers, one optimized for frequent access, which is priced the same as standard storage, and another one optimized for infrequent access, which is priced the same as SIA, and then you have a monitoring fee, uh, which is per object per month, uh, which is 0 0.0025 per 1,000 objects. Uh, so it's a very nominal fee. And uh, there are no fees for tiering. There's uh, no retrieval fees, and you just pay for your storage. Uh, you automatically get the savings uh, as soon as you move from the frequent access tier to the infrequent access tier, because it's a dynamic pricing model. 
Uh, this might be a tricky one to answer, but I'll ask this just on the off chance that you know it's from XOXO Gamer Guy, he or they rather ask whether or not there are plans for integrating intelligent tiering across other storage offerings on AWS. Yeah. So that, yeah, go ahead. You, you know, um, about 90 to 95% of our roadmap really comes from customers. So it's good feedback. Um, today, it operates between a frequent access and the infrared access tier. But, you know, um, we take the feedback and we continue to innovate. Uh, I think it's super interesting to think about other access tiers like integrating into intelligent tiering. Yeah, one, uh, one service that might be relevant in answering that question is a service called the AWS Storage Gateway, mm. which is a virtual appliance that allows you to tier from on-premises or privately owned and operated infrastructure and tier data back into S3 on the basis of it not being accessed. It's like a edge cache for storage that you can deploy and that will tier your data back into S3 if it's infrequently accessed. It's not part of this service, but it can solve similar kind of challenges where you've got this sort of hybrid architecture with some data at the edge and some data that you want to tier back into the that's cloud. Right. So that's worth taking a look at, AWS Storage Gateway, if you're not familiar with that. Okay, great, I think we're out of questions. The last question that I have for you before we wrap up is, how do customers get started with these new service offerings? So if they're interested in using uh, batch operations or storage tiering, how can they use the services today? Great. Uh, so for batch operations, it is in preview today. So there's a preview link uh, that you can sign up with on the S3 homepage or you can find it through our documentation or the What's New post that talked about the launch of the feature earlier this week. So there is a preview right now. Jobs and objects run through batch operations are free, so it's a great time to test drive the feature, try out uh, it for your particular use case, whether you want to copy, tag, apply access controls, restore objects from Glacier, or use AWS Lambda functions. So click on the preview link, sign up for it, and we'd love to hear your input and see you test drive the feature. And for S3 Intelligent Hearing, we launched uh, in all commercial regions, so you can just use it. It's generally available. You just put your storage in S3 Intelligent Hearing, and uh, you just see what the Intelligent Hearing is doing, and if you ultimately get cost savings. Um, if you have already storage in S3, you can very easily just transition it over with a lifecycle policy from S3 Standard or SIA into this new Intelligent Hearing storage class. Uh, so very simple, via the console or an API. That's great. I want to thank uh, my guests for joining me for this yeah. segment. I want to thank you for sticking with us here on twitch.tv slash AWS. We'll be back after a short break. Thank you. We'll great. see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.